Good morning, HVAC team. Today we're going to cover Unit 51, which is gas furnaces. Get that queued up. Um, I like talking about gas heat because, I don't know, it's just one of my favorite topics. Um, I like working on furnaces. I, I find them pretty easy once you kind of learn them, learn the sequence of operation and everything. And it keeps you busy in the winter, you know, if we're good with furnace service calls and furnace change outs, uh, that's your, that's your wintertime money. So anyways, objectives are to find the four categories of gas fire furnaces, list the five furnace cabinet configurations, describe the operation of a standing pilot natural draft furnace, describe the operation of an 80% mid efficiency furnace, describe the operation of a 90% condensing furnace, discuss the evolution of the heat exchanger, discuss the operation of atmospheric burners, explain why furnace efficiencies jump from 80% to 90%. So gas furnaces have been the most common form of heat for decades. Furnaces today are smaller, lighter in weight, and more efficient. A wide variety of gas furnaces are available to meet different applications. Uh, factors to be considered when choosing a furnace is fuel source, furnace location, efficiency, and venting. The furnace of today has evolved from the old pot belly stove where wood or coal burning stoves heated the room by a combination of convection and radiation. All objects in direct line sight from the stove were heated by radiation. However, if something blocked the path between the object and the stove, the intermediate object absorbed all the heat. Ooh, where are we at? The first central furnaces were essentially potbelly stoves inside a metal housing. Ductwork ran from the housing to all the areas in the house, producing a more even distributed uh, or distribution of heat. The next logical advance with, uh, was the addition of the fan to force air over the stove, which is now called a heat exchanger. This increased efficiency by, what, by wringing more heat out of the heat exchanger. It is also uh, it also reduced the size of the ductwork needed to deliver the air. Furnaces remained about the same for decades and performed reliably reliably with 60 to 65 percent efficiency. Changes came after the crisis of the uh, after the energy crisis of the 70s, and those changes increased the efficiency about 20 percent. The next major increase in efficiency took advantage. Uh, took advantage of the early mistakes by initially or intentionally designing a furnace to condense water. Efficiency could be increased and now furnaces are available with efficiencies up to 96.6%, um, which are your condensing furnaces. And then right here you have the heat exchanger. This is located inside of your furnace. Burner assembly would connect down here. Flames would shoot straight into your heat exchangers, into all the three chambers down here. Once the blower motor starts turning, it's gonna blow the air across the heat exchanger, and then the plenum will be located just above the furnace, and the blower will blow all that hot air straight up into the plenum, which all the ducts are connected to, and that's how the hot air is distributed throughout the ducting system. And up here, is where the induced draft motor would be connected and it would suck all the, the products of combustion that come out through these chambers would be sucked out and blown right out of the out of the home through the flue vent. And then older furnaces that don't have induced draft motors, it'll still go out of the uh, vent just because hot air rises. So it'll just be the natural draft uh, type of exhaust. So types of heat source. Um, so you have electric furnaces and then you have fuel burning furnaces. Electric furnaces are cool. They don't get as hot as fire because you know fire is fire, but electric furnaces are, are um, they're cool or on some applications. I've seen them on heat pumps. Heat pump systems are you know AC systems where you get your cooling and your heat from the compressor. But depending on the uh, weather conditions, sometimes it's hard to really heat the home in a heat pump so you can put in heat strips. You put the heat strips inside of the air handler 
And basically it's just these, uh, these little heat coils, almost like the little coils inside of a toaster. It's, it's like putting those inside of the, heat, the uh, inside of your air handler. And, you know, and that's electric heat. Um, so that's what, that's a form of electric heat. And then fuel burning furnaces are like the typical natural gas furnace or, uh, some, some people use propane, some, um, some areas they have oil burning furnaces. Um, California is typically natural gas furnaces. Um, so some of the types of, uh, Furnaces are upflow or counterflow or downflow. So upflow is basically the blower blows air from the bottom through the top. Counterflow, it will blow air from the top through the bottom. And then, uh, sorry, downflow. And then where's my horizontal units? There's also horizontal units that will blow from right to left or left to right. But the counterflow and, and downflow are the same. They 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 shoot the air from top to bottom. There's my horizontal. Um, horizontal furnaces are installed in low areas such as crawl space, attics, um, or partial basements. They require no floor space. Intake air enters at one end and is discharged out of the other end. <clears throat> low boy furnaces are built low in height to accommodate low ceilings. These furnaces are approximately four feet high, providing for easy installation in a low ceiling height basement. Gas fire boilers circulate hot water through baseboard heaters or radiant flow piping. Sorry, floor piping. In addition to the boiler, this, these systems include a number of additional components for the water loop. So boilers, when uh, for heat, because uh, boilers are usually in commercial uh, applications, and I uh, ask you know where the building gets there. Uh, so when you when when you get your heat from a boiler, what's happening is the boiler heats the water, and that hot water travels throughout the building to various heater coils. And, and that hot water is the source of heat. So instead of a heat exchanger having a fan blow air across it, you'll have a heater coil, which is like also a heat exchanger, but imagine a heater coil, but instead of refrigerant in it, there's hot water in it. And then when that fan is turning, it's blowing the air across that hot coil, and that's where you get your heat from. So I worked in like a few senior living facilities where they had that type of uh, heat system where all the different units had um they had central heat but they had a heater coil and that heater coil got us hot water from a boiler so um moving on gas furnace components the purpose of the manifold is to supply gas to the burners the manifold is usually a length of pipe connected to the gas valve on one end and closed on the other end. So this is what they're talking about. I'll make that bigger. I gotta find a better way to do this. As soon as I go back, it's gonna take me back to the first page. But anyway, this is your manifold. Many of you probably saw this on the furnaces in class. Many of you probably haven't, so come to class. Uh, we do have labs, all, you know, hands-on lab sessions now. So please, please, please book your sessions so we can touch this stuff and learn how they work in person for those who have it. And even those who have already, keep coming. But anyway, this is your manifold. So this mounts on the unit inside of the furnace. And this is just a piece of pipe. This is a piece of pipe. It's, 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 it's closed on the end. And the other end is connected to the gas valve. And once the gas shoots into this manifold, it is distributed through these orifices, these three brass orifices. Uh, they call them spuds. All it is is a little piece of brass that's screwed into this pipe with a tiny hole in the middle that lets the gas escape. And once that gas makes contact with your heat, uh, your hot surface igniter, which is right there, it'll ignite. Hot surface igniter is like a car lighter. It gets really, really hot and turns orange. And once it gets to a certain temperature, that gas will ignite. 
and um, and you and that's how you get a flame. So you notice this is way over here on the right. This first one lights up, and then there's flame spreaders in between these burners. And once this one lights up, the flame will spread over here. That one will go. Then it'll spread over here, and that one will go. And you got all three flames going at once, or all three burners going. So anyway, this is your gas manifold, and uh, that that's where the gas is coming out of. I've even had installs where the gas wasn't working and they didn't know what was going on. And it turns out that one of their, uh, one of the orifices was actually clogged. It, it had some caulking in it. Somehow somebody must have touched it and had caulk on their hands or something. But uh, you just literally get like a safety pin or something small to, to just dig it out or blow it out. Or you can even change out the spud. It, all you need is a crescent wrench to take that off and you can you know, replace it and problem solve. So that right here is a close up version of view of this black pipe right here going across here. And you have three spuds right here. And once the gas, once the gas valve opens, that gas is blown through these burners, hot surface igniter lights up and boom, you get your flame. There's your induced draft motor. The gas or the products of combustion come out. So your heat exchanger is behind this wall right here. The the same heat exchanger that I showed you in the previous picture, it will be located behind here. The bottom portion is connected down here. These flames are blowing right into it. The top portion is connected up here, which is where your induced draft motor housing is. Flames go in, emissions come out, and it gets sucked out by this fan and blown straight through the vent, which goes outside of the home somewhere. Anyway, moving on. Yeah, so you go all the way back to the beginning. I got to figure this out. So gas, for, gas furnace components, a ventory space open between orifice and ventory size determined by uh, three factors. Okay, uh, let's get deeper into that. Those are some weird little bullet points, but anyway, let's get into it. So. An orifice is a precisely drilled hole that meters the correct amount of gas into a burner. The orifice is drilled into a spud. Since the orifice size is what really matters, most people refer to the spud as the orifice. A ventory is a narrow passage located just after the orifice and is used on uh, atmospheric burners to draw in air from the from for combustion because flame needs oxygen to exist. Uh, the ventory is the initial portion of the burner that is shaped like an hourglass. The space between the orifice and ventory has to be open so that primary air can be injected by the jet action of the gas emitting from the orifice. The size of the orifice is determined by three factors, the specific gravity of the gas, the heat content of the gas, and the required BTUs per hour rating of the burner. Excuse me. Now that is not something that you have to figure out. This is done by the engineers before it's manufactured. What you have to do if you do end up changing an orifice is make sure you change it for the same one that you have. There's a little number on there. Um, when you order parts, you'll give the uh, manufacturer the model number of that furnace. And, and once they pull up that model number, every single part on there, every single wire, every single component, all that stuff comes up in their system specifically for that unit. So you just wanna make sure you use the, the same, uh, you replace it with the same size orifice because it's all been engineered for that unit. and an undersized or an oversized uh, uh, orifice is gonna change how much gas is going to that burner and, and it won't work right. It'll either overfire and it cut off and it'll give you an error code. It'll probably uh, trip your high limit switch or something, or it won't be enough and, um, and it just won't heat like it's supposed to. So always, even, in, in everything we do, not just with the orifice, but you always want to change out like for like. If you have, you know, whatever part you have, you want to swap it out with the exact same thing. You don't want to go over or under. 
Um, we already saw these upflows and counterflows. We got a couple of repeats on here, but we can work with it. So gas furnace components, heat exchangers. The job of the heat exchanger is to separate the combustion process from the air being heated. And as its name implies, exchange the heat from the combustion process to the air being circulated over the heat exchanger. Basically, what, like I was showing you before, the flame shoots into the chamber on one side and then the products of combustion shoot out on the other side. We don't wanna just have an open flame sitting there and distribute the heat from that because we'll also will be distributing the products of combustion, which can uh, include carbon monoxide, which can kill you. So the heat exchanger is there to allow the heat to enter the furnace while keeping the products of combustion contained. And it can then be blown out of the home while still being able to use that heat. The earliest heat exchangers were basically barrels with a hole in the bottom and a hole in the top. They were adequate for gas separation, but were rather inefficient heat transfer apparatuses. By flattening the heat exchanger, more resistance to, uh, to flow was created, which forced more of the combustion products to touch the walls of the of the heat exchanger increasing efficiency several of these flattened heat exchangers were used together to create one unit these are commonly called sectionalized heat exchangers because they are built in sections where am i this concept was taken further uh, with serpentine heat exchangers. The serpentine path and the narrow width helped squeeze more heat out of the combustion gas. These features also allow, or sorry, also required an induced draft motor to draw the combustion gases through the heat exchanger. To get into the 90% range, so this is the difference between the 80% furnaces and 90%, to get into the 90% range, you, you must condense. Most 90% furnaces are, are in an 80% furnace with a stainless steel uh, recuperative condensing coil. Most of these recuperative coils are built like a refrigeration coil, only from stainless steel. Traditionally, burners were located at the bottom of the heat exchanger. Today, many manufacturers are uh, Many, many manufacturers use the counterflow heat exchanger design in their 90% efficient furnace models. A key operating characteristic of any furnace is its temperature rise. For a standard furnace, the temperature rise range is usually 30 degrees Fahrenheit, such as between 50 and 80. However, the exact range will change depending on the unit's ca uh, capacity. The range will always be listed on the unit's uh, data tag or data plate. So the 90% efficient furnaces have a, a, a coil in it, and it uses that little coil to condense the, uh, to condense the, uh, the gas Back, you know, back into a liquid instead of allowing it to blow out of your, uh, to blow out of your, um, your flu vent. Because an 80% efficient furnace means 80% of the heat is blowing into your home and the other 20% is blowing right out of the uh, vent. But on a condensing furnace, it takes the flue gas and instead of blowing it straight through the vent, it goes across the coil first and condenses into a liquid. So the heat that would have went out, instead it, uh, it got condensed into a liquid. So you're only putting out like 4% of the heat or 10% or of the heat, depending on the efficiency of the unit, which, uh, which is based on the coil design. But, um, but basically having that coil in there is the difference between the 80% and 90, 90 plus percent.
category ratings and efficiencies of gas furnaces. So yeah, there are different categories, uh, different category ratings for your furnaces. Um, furnace manufacturers mostly offer two types of furnaces, mid efficiency category one, fan assisted and high efficiency category five, four, uh, condensing type furnaces. Lower efficiency gas furnaces are the old units um, now in the field, all of which were manufactured prior to 1992. One distinctive characteristic of the older design is the con convection flow of combustion gases uh, from the burner past the heat exchanger and into the vent. Never, I mean, sorry, newer standard gas furnaces burners use elect electric igniters, while some of the older units use standing continuous flame gas pilots. That one you don't really see too much anymore except for the uh, wall heaters. Usually the wall heaters still use a standing pilot, but most gas furnaces don't anymore. They have spark igniters, which I don't even see too much of that anymore, maybe only on like package units. Usually there's, uh, the most common that I see now in the field is the uh, hot surface igniter, which I was saying is similar to like how a car lighter works, where that uh, little element just heats up, it turns orange, and then once it heats up to a certain temperature, it'll ignite the gas, giving you your flame. Um, modern gas furnaces operational characteristics will place it into one of four categories based on its flue gas temperature and pressure. Category one furnaces can be divided into natural draft and fan assisted. Those are super old school natural draft. I do not believe they make those anymore. Many furnaces sold today are category one fan assisted. A benefit to fan assisted furnaces is that the heat exchanger operates in a negative pressure. Category two and category three furnaces are rare. Both require special vent materials making their installation more costly. A special high temperature plastic vent material was developed for use with these furnaces. The material is no longer manufactured by, uh, because of high failure rates uh, and the resulting legal action. Um, category four furnaces are also common and are 90% condensing furnaces. Since the flue gas is relatively cool, PVC can be used as vent material. PVC is easy to seal, um, easy to seal airtight and water will not bother it. So when you see PVC as your flue vent, you're looking at a condensing furnace, a 90% um, efficient furnace. Like they said, water doesn't bother it. Water and metal don't mix. Uh, water plus metal equals rust. Rust will eventually uh, rot a hole straight through some metal and then you'll have leaks in your exhaust vent. So with condensing furnaces, um, being that you know water does uh, you know accumulate in condensing furnaces, the PVC vent is fine because it will not rust because it's it's plastic. Also, um, the flue temperatures are lower, so like they said. So, with the eighty percent furnaces, that flue vent gets pretty hot, which is why they use double wall B vent. So that extra wall around the outside, it kind of creates a barrier between you and the inner wall, so it won't be as hot to the touch, but it's still hot. You still don't want it touching anything. The condensing furnaces condense the flue gases into uh, liquid, and so you have much lower flue gas temperatures. Um, so PVC is is a perfect uh, uh, exhaust pipe for condensing furnaces. So I was a little thrown off when I first started saying that. I was like, what is, what is this PVC right here? Because I'm used to that just being for drain lines, but you'll commonly see two inch PVC on furnaces 
and that'll be an indicator that you're dealing with a condensing furnace. Mid efficiency furnace. Mid efficiency furnaces are these 80% um, furnaces that we've been talking about, where 80% of your heat goes in the house, 20% goes right out through the flue vent. Um, furnace manufacturers achieve an efficiency of 80% by eliminating the pilot, improving heat exchanger efficiency, and adding an induced draft blower motor. The intention, sorry, the internal components of a mid efficiency furnace include induced blower uh, assembly, pressure switch, gas control valve, burner assembly, blower door safety switch, control box, and a filter retainer, air filter, uh, wraparound casing, heat exchanger, and finally blower and blower motor. When the first 80% efficient furnaces were being introduced, there were still many furnaces around with efficiencies in the 50 to 60% range. Today, the 80% furnace represents most manufacturers' bottom line. The minimum efficiency is 78. So basically, you're not gonna see any new units coming out of any supply house with less than 78% efficiency. Uh, we, know, we, we typically just refer to it as 80%. They're all 80% unless you get a condensed furnace, then we call those 90%. Even though there could be a range, it could be up to 96.6. Um, just kind of as a general term, we just go by either, either it's a condensed furnace or it's an 80%er. Those are pretty much the, the two choices. Um, product data. Following the information supplied by the manufacturer about the product during installation is important. Some information appears on the nameplate, but not all of it may be listed. Data that is particularly important include minimum gas line pressure, which is usually, uh, oh no, I'm thinking manifold. Manifold pressure is usually 3.5. The supply gas or the, the gas line pressure, Oh man, I think I forgot that. I think it's probably about, I know it's 11 for LP gas, and I think it's like, uh, I, gotta, I gotta read that again. I think it's about seven, something like that. Um, but yeah, so it includes minimum gas line pressure, maximum gas line uh, pressure, manifold gas pressure, 3.5, uh, temperature rise, like 30 typically, uh, electrical characteristics, input capacity, and output capacity. And BTUs. Um, although these units are primarily designed for heating, a number of accessories can be added, such as cooling coil installed in the supply plenum, a humidifier installed on the supply duct, and, uh, and an electronic air cleaner installed at the return air entrance to the unit. So the cooling coil installed they're talking about is a evaporator coil. If um, you can have central heat where you just have your um, your furnace connected to a duct system and boom there's your central heat you can add an evaporator coil to that which is connected to a condenser outside and then now you have central ac and heat um although these units are primarily designed for heating oh let me go back down 80 percent um a f u e units usually have output ranges of 35,000 to 124,000 BTUs per hour. On larger jobs, it, must, uh, it may be necessary to install two of them linked together in, configuration call, in a configuration called twinning. Gas high efficiency furnace, 90% efficient uh, furnaces. High efficiency or condensing type furnaces are rated at 90% AFUE or better. They differ from the 80% furnaces, mid, uh, the 80% mid efficiency furnaces in that they, it's in that an extra heat exchanger, the secondary heat exchanger is added to extract more heat from the flue gas. That is the difference. That is the difference. 80% efficient furnaces don't have that extra coil, that secondary heat exchanger. Um, this construction reduces the volume and temperature of the flue gas. 
making it possible to use smaller vent pipes and simplify venting arrangement. And that is very true. I mean, running the B vent, it's not technically like a hard thing, but previously it's just easier. When you run the flu vent, there's a mechanical connection between each fitting or between each two pieces. You have to snap them together correctly or you'll have a leak. You never want leaks in, 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 in the exhaust pipe at all, the, the vent pipe at all, because uh, now you have products of combustion leaking into the home, which is dangerous. So um, you don't want no leaks. So all your connections, they're mechanical connections and you have to put them together. You got to make sure that they snap, that they lock in the place correctly. And then, um, and sometimes that could be a little bit of a pain. Sometimes it might be a little hard to line things up, especially if the materials got banged up a little bit, you know, in transition or, um, or just by somebody who don't know what they're doing or, or, or just by mistake. But so that's one thing to consider. And then, you know, the elbows are adjustable. So you gotta, you know, gotta kind of know how to twist them and turn them and manipulate them to, to reach to wherever you're trying to go. And PVC is easy. You know, you just get your fittings, you put the primer in there, you put the PVC glue in there, you snap it together and you go on to the next piece. Um, just, just a little easier. And then also the, the B vent piping comes in, you know, predetermined lengths. You got four footers, two footers, six footers, one footers, whatever, you know, your elbows, which are also like about a foot when it went straight but sometimes not all the time but sometimes it's hard to find the right piece to make that final connection and then when it comes to pvc you can cut it to whatever size you want you don't have to really worry about it get your pvc cutters and snip snip and you're done so you know pvc is just a little easier to deal with but uh the vent pipe ain't hard but you know you can save some time uh with pvc if you're you know doing a condensing furnace so combustion condensate piping. The condensate drain line should be trapped. However, many furnaces have a condensate trap built into the furnace, eliminating the need for another trap. Some condensing furnaces require an, an external trap in the condensate drain line. Not all condensate pumps are approved, excuse me, for, in, uh, for installation on condensing furnaces because the furnace condensate is mildly acidic, uh, typically in the pH range of 3.2 to 4.5. Due to the corrosion or corrosive nature of the condensate, a condensate pH neutralizing filter may be desired. These filters are typically PVC, uh, PVC canisters filled with limestone. Uh, do not normally combine a furnace condensate drain and an evaporator condensate drain. Uh, that's usually what's done. Pressure, uh, pressure produced in an upflow coil plenum can pressurize the drain and the secondary heat exchanger in the furnace. If the furnace, uh, if the furnace air conditioner and humidifier drains are combined and, uh, and drained together, then the air conditioner drain must have an external field supply trap prior to the furnace drain connection, which we always do, but almost all the time, the, uh, the secondary heat exchanger drain is piped right in with the evaporator coil drain. That, that's just how it's done. But there, we always put a trap and a vent on the evaporator coil drain every time. So um, that is uh, just how it's done, but I guess because of the corrosion that could occur, it's, it's, it's not recommended. Uh, moving on, if the furnace, air conditioner, and humidity, nope, moving on again. When condensing furnaces are used in an attic application or over a finished ceiling, local codes may require a drain pan under the entire furnace to prevent damage to the ceiling uh, in the event of a plugged drain. So yeah, definitely on a condensing furnace, you wanna have a drain pan underneath it. Uh, even on non-condensing furnaces, when you have a, a you know, when you got AC, you, we also have uh, a drain underneath the EVAP coil and the furnace. So you just wanna protect it. I usually put on AC, I usually put a, uh, a flood switch 
on the on the secondary for the evap coil and on the pan on a condenser furnace if it's just heat then yeah there's no flood switch on you know there's no secondary uh, there's no evap coil i don't usually use a flood switch but i'll put a switch on the pan though so if um you know just in case just to be safe so anyway um variable capacity furnaces the condensate drain line should be trapped however many furnaces have a condensate trap built into the furnace eliminating the need for another trap some condensing furnaces require an external trap in the condensate drain line not all condensate pumps this is all the same points that we just went over i believe yes it is um anyway you can get furnaces that are two-stage combustion um low fire high fire ecm blower motors ecm is electronic commutative motors which have the ability of modulating so you can go you know from high speed and then when the load decreases it'll decrease in speed and it'll adjust itself based on the heat load or i guess this is heating uh the load would be cooling like it would basically It'll, you know, the lower the temperature in the room, the higher that fan is going to turn. And then as temperatures start to balance out, the fan will ramp down, um, you know, so it'll ramp up or down based on necessity. Uh, ECM blowers work well with low fire and high fire operations. So, you know, there's different types. Uh, how you know if you have a two-stage furnace, you will have, often you will have two uh, pressure switches, but then also your gas valve. There'll be two uh, two knobs on your gas valve. Um, there was no pictures on here, but when you learn how to adjust the manifold pressure on your gas valve, the inlet and outlet pressure. Um, well, no, the when you when you learn how to adjust the manifold pressure, you'll know that there's a little brass cap that you have to unscrew to get to the uh, the spot where you adjust it when you have a two-stage furnace there'll be two of those little brass caps on your gas valve letting you know it's a two-stage gas valve for a two-stage furnace um i will show you if they do end up having a picture of one anyway product data 90 percent furnaces uh uh, product data cover information similar to that of a 80% furnace, but with a few additions. Since these are condensing type furnaces, a drain for the condensate is needed. Many high efficiency furnaces have provisions for piping combustion air to the furnace from the outside. This keeps the furnace from drawing air out of the house. Piping in Piping in outside combustion air also keeps household chemicals uh, that are in the air inside the house out of the furnace. Piping in combustion air, uh, sorry, piping in combustion air means that two PVC lines are required, one for the combustion air and one for the vent gases. Uh, some direct vent furnaces use, uh, use concentric vents. This allows both vent pipe and combustion air to pipe uh, to pipe to terminate through a single exit in the roof or sidewall. Okay, so I know I probably said that weird, but those uh, concentric vents, my first time seeing one, I was confused. I was extremely confused. I saw my, my exhaust vent my, my vent pipe coming up and going out the sidewall. I saw my combustion air pipe come out and then connect to the same fitting as my exhaust vent going out of one vent. And it totally threw me off. But a concentric vent, it, it's like a pipe in a pipe. So the, the middle pipe was the exhaust and the pipe around the outside was the uh, combustion air, but it looked like one pipe. So it threw me off. I'm like, why would they do that? But uh, but once it was explained to me, then it made sense. Cause it went to, 
the two pipes went to like a TY, but that TY, you know, it had the, the two types of connections. So basically the two, the, the vent, the, the, the vent, uh, the exhaust was not mixing with the combustion air. It just, it kind of looked like it was, but it wasn't. So that threw me off, but that does exist. And it, it you know, it just kind of saves on construction and, you know, and on time and space, you know, you can put the two vents through the one termination rather than two. And, um, and you need your combustion air. The, the fur, if the furnace is in a closet, then you have to pipe your combustion air pipe up into the attic. But when the pipe, when the convert, when the condenser furnace is already in the attic, you don't really have to pipe out your combustion air. It's just, you know, it's already there. So, um, anyways, yeah, those those concentric vent things that that threw me off when I first seen it. So that that's out there. So if you see your combustion and your uh, your combustion and your vent connected don't don't panic <laughs> i mean you know unless they didn't use the right kind of vent so anyways the positive pressure in the vent pipe created by the draft inducer fan in 90 percent furnaces is not very strong long runs or several elbows can reduce flow through the vent so yeah that's another one too you, you don't want to use too many elbows on your uh, vent pipe um, because that will reduce your um, airflow, and you don't want to reduce that. You want that. You want the products of combustion to be able to be blown out of the home. Um, you also want to have slope. Your your vent pipe actually needs to have slope too, which I didn't see mentioned here. Um, and you don't. You want the run to be as short as possible. The less distance it has to travel, the less elbows that it has to go through. The the easier it is for the 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 uh, products of combustion to get outside of the home. So, in summary, furnaces can be grouped by force, uh, by fuel source, venting characteristics, cabinet configurations, and efficiency. Most manufacturers offer two types of gas furnaces: 80% efficient Category One fan assisted, and 90% efficient Category Four condensing furnaces. All furnaces today are made using an induced draft motor combustion blower and an improved efficiency heat exchanger. High efficiency furnace, furnaces achieve 90 plus percent efficiency or 90 percent plus whatever uh, by adding a secondary heat exchanger uh, which condenses water from the flue gas using a secondary heat exchanger <laughs> made of stainless steel. Medium efficiency furnaces are vented with V-type vent, which is that double wall, you know, metal vent I was talking about. And then high efficiency furnaces are vented with PVC, uh, require combustion air to be piped in from the outside. That is it for Unit 51. So this video, in addition to reading Chapter 51 in your book, um, that should definitely get you through your review questions and teach you a lot about um, about gas furnaces. Coming into class would also teach you a lot about gas furnaces. So get in here, get this lab time in so we can all be ready for the field. Um, other than that, um, have a good one, stay safe, stay healthy, and I will catch y'all on the next one.